you know, when I was a teenager, I fell in love with your record Awareness, and mm. one of my uh, one of the top piano trio albums for me. You know, very uh, very big album for me. Wow. The song in there called Strays, and Strays. Yeah, yeah. When I first listened to it, I didn't look at the cover. It was just I was sitting in my room listening to the to the record, uh -huh. and I thought, what kind of standard is this? I I've heard this before. <laughs> But I didn't know where from, you know, but it didn't sound like... So I, I looked at the cover and says, it, it's a song, you know, by you and it, you've written it for Billy Strayhorn. And it's, it couldn't really put it together because, as I said, it sounded really, really fresh, but also like it has been there forever. And uh, I've, I have the same feeling when I listen to you play solos, but when, you, when I listen to you improvise, you find something that um, sounds... Um, as if it has been in, invented in the moment, although it, it contains the possibility to be there forever, like a composition. And I'm really wondering how uh, how aware you are of that, or if it's something that you have put a lot of thought into. Or well, first of all, that's like the, you know, it's the nicest thing anybody could ever say. Because uh, and thank you for that. Because um, that those are qualities that I love in in players. You know. Um, I think Keith Jarrett is a is a great example of that, and he himself said it shouldn't sound. Predict, there's a difference between predictable sounding and something that sounds like, you know, that was the perfect way to, you know, end that idea. And so he talked about the same thing. Um, and for me, um, you know, I think I just I love. Uh, great songs you know and i love i love great melodies so in and 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 in, in so many different styles and, and uh, genres i mean i started uh by listening by picking up uh songs by billy joel you know that's how i started playing piano and i loved because i heard something you know um so, well there was a couple things happening with him was i figured out that there was definitely like a Uh, connection to classical music with some of Billy Joel's writing, so that just strengthened my um, interest in in classical music. Then you study, then you see how unbelievable those melodies are, with so many of them, and the and the incredible m melodists that the Germans, the French, I mean the English, you know, the, it's like it just goes on and on and on. And so I listened to a lot of that, and for me. Uh, Writing the writing just came out of um, my wish to try to be melodic as an improviser, you know, because to me that was I was attracted to the really melodic improvisers because they it felt like that they were telling a story, I guess, you know, and um, so that's really where it's coming from—a desire to to be melodic and to and to. I don't like hearing people over overstate things, overplay, and take and take you know long solos unless unless there's really something that's developing, you know. And for me, it's uh, easier to develop something on a shorter. And it's the same way with my with my writing too, because I've never written anything that's uh, longer than maybe a big band chart or something like that. And I hardly have done that. Mm -hmm. But I, so for that reason, I do like to think in terms of how, you know, how to, how can I shape this thing and keep it interesting to people, you know, and to myself. And uh, I've just always been attracted to people who think that way. And so I'm, I'm basically, you know, emulating, trying to emulate, that but really melody comes first uh, i get tired of myself when i'm when i'm playing um things that are um uh, worked out or right i mean i mean i'll never in you know, it i play licks all the time every you can't you can't ignore playing something that's not completely in the moment and spontaneous you just can't but you can you can at least try you know and so i i uh I've gotten to a place where I'd rather not say anything at a particular moment if, uh, than just fill up the space, you know. So, um, 
But yeah, I'm not. I am consciously thinking thinking of trying to establish an idea, strong as strong an idea as I can. Also to establish a mood too. You know, I'm really in, you know I, that's why I loved Bill Evans. You know, or uh, and even like I, my my first two idols were Oscar Peterson and Bill Evans. You know, two very different players, except. Um, I think they had a lot of similarities too. I mean, uh, it was really important to each of them to make the piano ring, you know. And so, if you can make your instrument ring, you can get a you can get away with a lot of simple ideas, you know. Like that, I always felt that way about Jim Hall. Yeah. You know, just hearing his amp in right in front of me, and just and just seeing that he just plays one note as the opening, and it's just you hear that sound. And it's like yeah, who needs more than that, you know? So, uh, unfortunately, I'm not a trained... That's one play, That's one of many places that I feel like I wish I could set the clock back a little bit and go to a teacher, a Russian, strict Russian teacher who could show me about real sound production. Because I sort of... I said- your, your sound is is beautiful and huge. Uh, I'm I'm want, actually that's another thing I was wondering about how how do you actually use your sound. I have it in my mind, and and then I try to just imitate what's 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 what I'm thinking about in my mind. But actually, <clears throat> I find that I'm very inconsistent depending on pianos. I don't like asking for a, a nine foot piano, for instance. It seems like too much piano for me. I hate to. <laughs> down so so meek uh but um i feel like i can't get nine feet of sound out of the out of nine <laughs> nine feet of piano so i feel like i am more, i'm more consistent on smaller pianos because i really don't have the the gravity or the strength to really get us particularly as the as the tempo increases and i have to really get around that way so i prefer to stick to an instrument that i feel like i can handle and then I feel like I can I can get some control out of the piano. And then when I'm, you know, I'm thinking. I mean, Shearing was another big influence on me. His solo piano records, yeah. and uh, the way that he would bring out the top note, you know, when he would sort of harmonize uh, a melody. Uh, I always loved that sound on those Concord records. I think he was playing like a big Baldwin on those records. I just there's something just so glassy about it. And so something as simple as harmonizing a melody, that was that was all you know. That's all. I, I mean, if I could just do that the rest of my life, that would be fine. And at the same time, my love for orchestrators, you know, and. Uh, because I'm simultaneously interested in how people orchestrate melodies, whether it's on piano or, or if you're an arranger, um, it's more fun to orchestrate, you know, something that's, uh, you know, melodic. So, so I kind of just go there pretty quickly. And I find that because there's so much you can do with mood in terms of how you space your voices and, the choices that you make, that's more fun. And so I guess my my solos can tend to tend to be this more thoughtful type of style of soloing um, because um, I'm into I'm into mood kind of playing, you know. And then I like to think, or you know, orchestrate or, or, or like an orchestrator. For that reason, I think that's why I love Joe Zawinul so much. I always felt like Joe must have been a great organ player, but I don't know if he ever played organ. Well, you know what? I mean? He did. He did on Bitches Brew, maybe. On Bitches Brew, but also on In a Silent Way. I thought there was some organ on there. Oh, you're right. I never thought about that. Yeah, because you know when he did those duets like with Wayne, and he's playing his own bass, and the and man, that guy's like fucking. You know Ricard Strauss down there, yeah. man. It's like those, and uh, I think he was a big influence on me becoming an organ player, actually. Mm. Uh, and I was, I love my, I'm, I'm getting back into my synthesizer love these days, which was my first love. You know, I, a keyboard player has the power of, of being able to, do, to really orchestrate. You yep. know, and um, so. I think that's always been more interesting to me than um, 
playing a shitload of notes. Although I, although there are certain people who play a lot of notes that I that I really like, <laughs> like Coltrane, for instance. But you know, or Sonny Rollins. But um, but Sonny is also one of the most melodic of them all. I mean, he's like always thinking about. It. He's always quoting tunes, you know. And uh, that's because there's such a beautiful logic to a great melody. And um, yeah, and then, yeah, sound wise, uh, Shearing and Keith Jarrett and Oscar and Bill were like mm. the guys. And then later on, Bud, because I didn't really know much about Bud until later. And um, how did you discover him? Oh, what was the, you know, what was the entry point for, for, for Bud? Well, when I went to the, I met, you know, Peter Bernstein I'm, and I met at the summer high school jazz program at the Eastman School of Music in 1984. And uh, he, he, he was way more versed in the history of, of jazz at that point than I was. I had like little random pockets of, you know, things that I had been listening to very heavily and then big holes Of stuff that yeah i know big holes of stuff that i didn't know shit about and he was like oh oh man you know that duke record right you know he's like duke i don't know anything about duke so he uh and actually that summer he we both learned a lot about duke through another guy named joey cavacino hmm. who was the who was, is a great alto player he can play like fucking johnny hodges and um he was a duke fanatic He was like a prodigy. He was like, at, at 13, he knew more about Duke than most, you know, whatever. So he really schooled us in Duke that summer. And also Peter knew about, yeah, he was listening to Charlie Parker before I was, you know, I was, I had to like go back, you know, I, I, I knew some classic shit. Like I liked Miles, but I didn't know much about the electric Miles, but yeah. And then I was listening to tons of pop music and, you know, Stevie Wonder and, you know, And then once I got to New York, it was like, oh, shit, you really have to, because of Peter and his influence on me and other, you know, I, I just sort of like gravitated towards that bebop scene that was a very deep scene. It was like a jazz police kind of scene. Like, you know, if you don't know any, every fucking Sonny Clark record, man, you're, you're, you're a loser. Yeah. You know? Were you intimidated by them? Kind of, but I, I did, there was something about, um, that discipline of really getting into that, yeah, that I recognized as being important, you know, because a lot of it had to do with, I mean, all those people had incredible sounds on their instruments. I mean, Bud Powell, mm -hmm. I mean, he spoke like a fucking horn, you know, and I was like, well, you know, I, I, I knew I couldn't do that. So it was like, well, how do you, and, and I thought I knew like kind of bebop until I started really really paying attention to what these guys were playing, man. It's like very advanced and it had a lot more to do with Baroque music than, than, than anything else. You know, it was just so the, the ornamentation and the logic, but most of all, just the phrasing and, and, you know, of Bud and Bird. But to this day, I know almost no Charlie Parker heads, for instance, like I never really took the time to do that. <laughs> And I never play Charlie Parker heads when I when I gig. I never think to do that. Um, and they're beautiful. I should I should probably get those under my fingers. But I had trouble with them the same for the same reason that I had trouble with learning Bach because I I was frust always frustrated by fingering. And uh, I think because I never really I blew off my scales yeah. when I was a kid because I realized when somebody showed me upper structure triads. I was like, holy shit, I can just arpeggiate all the time. And that sounds really impressive. Yeah. And a lot of harmonic shit going on now. And I was like, fuck the scales. It's the arpeggios are easier. Yeah. And <laughs> Oh man, this rings a bell. You know, I once Does it? my teacher said to me, without your arpeggios, you're nothing. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> That's a crushing thing to say. He said it, it was kind of funny because also I, I knew exactly what he meant. You know, I, I, I knew that I had to work on something else, you know, but. I think I'm still that way without, without my arpeggios. I am nothing. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and so that's why I prefer slower tempos because I can get away with my shitty fingering. And um, if it is fast, I just play slower, I suppose. <laughs> uh, instead of being frustrated by things that seem to be beyond what I can do technically, I I just find another way to <laughs> to, to try to sound strong, you know, or just to try to add something musically to the conversation. Yeah, or your limitations, you know, they add up to being your sound in a way also. Yes. I think that's what I saw in Jim Hall. Mm -hmm. And Jim said to me once that he, he told a story about putting Wes Montgomery into a cab. <laughs> and it occurred to him. Did you have you heard this story? Sorry. Yeah. It crossed his mind that he had the opportunity to close the, the taxi door on Wes's hands. <laughs> And then he went, ah, no, I better not. Yeah. You know? He was so jealous of Wes. And he, and, and I never, because I never really made a connection between Wes and, and Jim. But he, of course, every guitar player, I'm sure, thought he was God because everything looked so easy. And, um, but he finally said, well, even, you know, I'll never sound like Wes, you know, no matter how, how hard I try. So, you know, here's what people say that I have that, that are, that is unique, you know. Or maybe he was aware, he had a, enough awareness to know that he had some, unique qualities and maybe it was just about working on those making you know bringing you know really really making those uh making that your sound and 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 a sh you know really finally shedding your your influences more you know mm -hmm. getting rid of your influences so but i had some yeah i mean paul blay uh did i tell you the story about paul blay i don't know which one i, I heard a story from you of Paul Blay before. Yeah, it's probably the same one because I only have two. But um, <laughs> they were good stories, though. Yeah, yeah. He heard me at the Village Gate, and he said to me, um, he just kind of went right up to me as if we 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 had known one another, but we we didn't. It was, he was a kind of that kind of guy. He'd just start talking to you as if you were just picking up from a conversation, and he said, uh, "Yeah, you know, you ought to take, uh, you know, uh, collect up all." you should really just collect up all your favorite records and throw them out the window. You know, that's what he said. And I was both hurt and, but because I could see it in his eyes that he wasn't saying it in any kind of mean spirited way at all. He was just being completely frank and I could tell that he liked me and liked me enough to, to say that, you know, and then we had coffee and, uh, I, I, I just getting to know him a little bit made me really think about that statement and then getting more familiar with his music, which at the, at that point I was embarrassed to, you know, I was embarrassed that I, there wasn't more of, of his records that I, that I uh, knew, huh. but particularly when I got into him, I realized, Holy fuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's right. You know, um, cause that's important to me to have your own sound, you know, I mean, How, much, how many more years am I going to be doing a gig and playing my romance and someday my prince will come and, um, you know, tunes that are associated with very, very intimately associated with other artists, you know, mm. and the artists that I love, you know. Yeah. So being around people like Jim Hall, I mean, maybe I think uh, and I was really messed up in the head when I was with Jim about the whole Bill Evans thing. You know, I, I just couldn't I couldn't get that out of my brain, mm. you know. But did you yeah. stop listening to him at, at a point? Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Keith's the same way. Unless it's Keith solo piano, mm -hmm. something like that. I can always get, get some of that for inspiration and not feel like I'm going to copy him because <laughs> what the fuck is he doing? I mean, it's just so beautiful. Um But yeah, people like Oscar, I certainly had to stop listening to Oscar. I mean, that was just, mm. but the fact is I'm still a corny motherfucker. I mean, I still, I, you know, I, 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 I mean, if, if the situation's right, I have no problem trying to make something feel like Oscar, you know, if I can, or like Errol Garner, if I can, you know, and just because that's, it's more the feeling of it that I love more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause, cause I don't think. And I think people are very much afraid of that feeling nowadays. It's weird. Mm. Like, you know, what's wrong with swinging? I mean, or, or not even swinging, just um, 
But I think it goes beyond swinging. I think something like Oscar or Errol, Errol Garner or the Basie Band, it's uh, it's joy. It's a joyful sound, you know. Um, but again, I think people are people uh, associate that with being being uh, old fashioned. Yeah. You or corny or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, and also maybe that's a subjective term, joy. You know, I mean, um, Ornette Coleman's music was joyful too. Uh, well, that was swinging too. Yeah. You know, with Ed Blackwell and Charlie Hayden and shit. So it did have the that those roots right there. Um, but it is subjective. I mean, maybe Cecil Taylor's music is joyful to some people, you know, or whatever. But I do love that era. I do love the era of era of 1930s, 1940s, 19, you know, and the and the feeling that. Um, But if you if you emulate a feeling, you can. Yeah, get that it. can apply to anything. You, you, can, know? you can just play how you play it or play your your stuff. But if you yeah. have a feeling, that's not really copying. That's that's more like a jumping off point. Yeah, you're right. Yes, like copying right. actual phrases of somebody, you know, which right. is important to. To do that at a certain point to get right. to know somebody or to build up your uh, fundamental stuff, but yeah. you know to get trapped in in that, that's yeah, hmm. yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm actually very curious about your trio, not your uh -huh. trio anymore because it's now it's a collective thing. I, I'm wondering you you've been playing to it for over 20 years. Oh, it's been 30 years, my friend. 30. 30 fucking years yeah oh okay uh so i'm wondering uh, if you in the uh, in the beginning did you just dive into playing gigs or did you also have like a period where you just had a lot of jam sessions or practice together it was more gigs we had this this place up you know at this place augie's which is now smoke and uh, also the village gate because our friend rafael delugoff started booking the ground floor terrace, they called it there. Um, and he was booking some combination of us a lot. But I think before that it was Augie's and we played there quite often. And I played there without Peter and Bill too, quite often. Mm -hmm. um, and then it became, then it became at least a one night a week or two night a week thing with Peter and Bill. And um, we just, I don't really remember rehearsing too much in, in, uh, until we started making a record, you know, making a record. And then we had like an official rehearsal somewhere to to figure out what, what the hell we were going to play. But Peter and I would hang out and like, he'd bring, yeah, check out this tune. We, we'd bring in tunes and Bill would suggest tunes. I don't know if he was writing at that particular time. Probably was. But, um, and uh, it, yeah, it, it really developed by having a lot of gigs mm. and having a lot of, even though it was a small kind of shithole, it was always filled with people and people were listening. A lot of them were, some nights were really noisy and some nights were, it felt like a scene, you know, it felt like, Hey, people are coming to check us out. And, uh, you felt this kind of, uh, good kind of pressure, you know, to, um, to not just fuck around, but, you know, um, it presents something, yeah. you know, and, um, so that was great. That was a great training grounds. And then at the village gate, it was a similar thing, but it was the village gate, you know, it was like, oh, anybody could show up here today. And just the history of this place, you know, and even though it wasn't the room downstairs room where miles played and everything, it was, you know, it's where I met Pat Metheny and Charlie Hayden for the first time at that gig, you know, and, um, I think Jim Hall and his wife, Jane um, came in to officially hear me uh, after I had been a student. I had been a student at Jim's in his class, you know, but I don't think he had ever heard me play out. Mm -hmm. So he, he knew I had this regular gig at the gate playing solo piano. And that's when he, you know, shortly after that, he called, started calling me for, for work. And um, not calling me for work. <laughs> Larry, do you have any work for me, man? It's Jim Paul. Get, get right back to me. Uh, hiring me, I mean, um, and, um, so 
yeah, it was already like we felt like we're contenders here. We better fucking get our shit together and uh, take it seriously. And that yeah, was a great atmosphere, a great environment to be in, you know. Did I you mean, guys talk a lot about, you know, after gigs, did you get into like analyzing what you did or, uh, you know, um, commenting on, on stuff that happened in the music? To, or is it something that because you've played so much, you didn't really have to talk about it? Or I think we did, but not not to a great extent. With Peter and I, it was it would mostly be uh, <laughs> it would mostly be about how much we sucked, you know, and then like how to, maybe how can we deal with that, you know? But once we started making records, we then when you know you once you start hearing yourself, yeah, back, you know that that painful process of of reality um then you can then you start talking about the music because there it is there there's the evidence of what we did so let's you know that's that's very helpful you know to have that opportunity even if you it regrettably has to be heard by people you know but um but but you really learn from that but yes i think there was a fair amount of analyzation you know sometimes um but not that much How is it now? Do you talk about the music? Do you do you get into I, stuff like? I think now, like if we do, it's more about like uh, you know, if we're on a long tour and maybe we realize we're getting sick of certain things, you know, and um, someone might have an opinion about not playing a certain tune anymore. And um, um, if anything, it's getting freer. You know, we're getting much much freer about you know, repertoire wise, uh, and what, what, you know, and, uh, deviating from the sort of typical way of delivering jazz, yeah. uh, in terms of, you know, and, uh, even my role as an organ player, I, I've sort of realized that, you know, you know, you know, you don't have to always think of it as the typical role of me playing bass and things like that. Like, And that was something that, that Jack DeJohnette sort of opened up to me. You know, he's like, hey, man, if you don't feel like walking bass all the time, you don't have to. It's like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Really? Well, well, that, well, well then where will the bass be? I don't know. <laughs> Nowhere. <laughs> you know, and so that's a, that was a very freeing idea, you know. And um, because in the end, what is it? It's just people aren't, the most people who come to a show aren't going, Now, are they going to live up to the traditional <laughs> approach to the organ trio? No, they just want to come away with hearing some good music. Yeah. Um, so I guess the more mature, the, more, the older you get, you hopefully realize that. And, you know, I don't know. Because, you know, I can get really bogged down with hearing myself over and over. So sometimes you really just do have to strip something away, you know, or... Um, just remember that the instrument is just a means to to making some some music you know and it doesn't have to be restricted to some kind of uh predictable way of of playing it and you know and so we play a lot fewer our repertoire has changed a lot you know we're not gonna we're not gonna we've i don't think we've played a shuffle in 10 years you know and you know and um we'll discuss things more during you know during the during the making of a record or getting ready for a record like you know you know maybe we should i mean we never really have a concept for a record or anything like that and after we've recorded we'll certainly all be talking about what was a good take or whatnot yeah yeah i hate it i hate it but um you just yeah you gotta but face it in the end where you say like we did good or i'm sure you also play for your own in enjoyment you know so yeah uh, that translate when you listen back to it why what's happening there that you can't um enjoy it oh no i i i well i i think i can enjoy enough of it yeah you know i think um and uh and then you have to live with the stuff that you don't enjoy yeah. and and remind yourself that you're you're being a total egomaniac anyway because um You're probably listening to yourself more than yeah. the music as a whole, <laughs> and um, and uh, and then you go like, well, how bad could it be? I mean, we've been doing it a long time. 
Are we, you know, does it really suck, you know? There's a lot suckier things out there than this, so, okay. Yeah. Let it go. Um, Lou Donaldson used to say he would do a record, you know, in a day, which was typical, and uh, he would never listen to it. He'd move on to the next one. <laughs> He'd never listen to his records. Yeah. And uh, I think it was even more than that. He'd do a take, and he'd feel fine about it, and they'd just... They wouldn't even hear the fucking thing. Then they wouldn't be like, okay, guys, let's go into the booth and listen back. In the old days, that didn't happen. They didn't even listen back. Yeah. The producer slash engineer, whoever it was, would, would say, great, guys. All right, we're, we'll see you on May 12th for the, you know, and, you know, and I think maybe that's better. Mm. <laughs> you, know? You, you know, you know that you're just going to have to, like, be your best self in that moment and then let it go. How do you think Keith works in this uh, topic? Did he t talk to you about that? Not really. I don't think we did. He did write my father a letter before we had, before we spoke before we met the first time. And um, apparently, I had said something about. Um, preferring his trio records over his solo piano records or something like that. Which I don't think I would ever say that to Keith Jarrett or or maybe my my father made it sound like that to him or something. This is when he my father met him and yeah. set up a lesson and and I was so sad that he had gotten that message, you know. But he but he said I understand. Oh God, I could actually read it. Where is it? I have it somewhere. Wow. Yeah. Do you still have it? Yeah. But where did I put it? I'll 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 find it for you. But maybe not right now. I do have this picture though. Let's see. Wow. That's actually me. The one with the bit with more hair is me. <laughs> And that's one of his sons. Yeah. He was visiting him at the time. Mm-hmm. Crazy. Wow. Anyway. <laughs> you were um, 16 or how old were you? 17? Yeah, I was like 16, 15, 16. But anyway, he did say something to the effect of, um, that's okay. I'm, you know, I understand p people who have more interest in my, you know, less interest in my solo piano efforts. Um, The solo piano is uh, the, the the fully improvised concerts are things that I'm paraphrasing, but he was basically saying sometimes we're just working out shit. <laughs> you know, it's like it's a, or or he was really saying it's about the process. Yeah, and you you have to accept every stage of it. Yeah, you know, and it might not it might not be it for everyone to to want to listen to. The process um but i need to go through it sure. and i need to go through it in real time you know something you know i'm paraphrasing but i think that was the message of it but he was a genius i mean it's not fair uh as i already said you know awareness is one of my you know very important records for me and i'd love to hear a couple of uh insights from you from the from the recording session how did it feel to And what oh. process to you know to write that music to uh, to ask Paul Motion you know to me oh, yeah. it's one of the my top five piano rec trio records and I I can't stop listening to it and it's so beautiful. Thank you very much. Well, Matt Pearson originally wanted me to make a solo record, I think, and then it was like, hey, what, what, maybe we can do like trio or duo, and you know, I think I thought about I don't know who came up with the idea. But I think I came up with the idea of Paul. I love that trio with Paul and uh, and Frizzell and Lovano. Yeah. I love that they were able to play standards in such a untraditional way. And I started to get really influenced by that and Paul Blay and, you know, and Brad was signed to the label or I don't know how conscious it was, but I felt like I got to try to do something a little bit out of the box, you know. And also that's something that really is different from my organ records because that's all people knew of me yeah. uh, was what? three or four organ records. Uh, once I committed to the idea of Paul, I was just like, what the fuck am I thinking? What am I going to do? <laughs> and I, I met him once, and but we didn't really know each other, and we had never played. So I had maybe seven tunes planned, 
Actually, I stupidly didn't even use them for the whole record, right? I only had them on like three or four tunes. I thought it would be cool to have solo, duo, and trio. Sure, yeah. But afterwards, I was like, it's fucking Paul Motion. I had them for two days. Yeah. What was I thinking? But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> really bad decision. Really bad decision. I could have made a complete record with Paul Motion. <laughs> anyway, I made little demos of on the piano of the theme, you know, little songs I wanted to play and sent it to Paul on a cassette, called him and said, uh, you know, uh, um, how much I was, uh, looking forward to it. And when we get closer to the, to the time of the date, um, I would love to, you know, just have one rehearsal. So I think at that time he said, okay. And then it got closer and I hadn't heard from him. I was like getting nervous that, you know, and finally I got him on the phone and I said, oh, did you get my cassette? And I said, yeah. And I, it wasn't really clear to me that he had listened to it. I don't know if he did. And then I said, okay, great. So we're about two weeks away. Do you think you, will you have a day we can rehearse? And he goes, what do you want to rehearse for? And I said, oh, well, you know, we, ne we never really met and we never play together. So I thought it was just be comfortable for everybody to sort of meet. And he goes, I've heard you, man. You sound great. It's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> And my initial sort of uh, cynical reaction was like, oh, he doesn't, he just doesn't want to, you know, he'd rather do something else. He doesn't want to take the, yeah. but no, when I got, when I got there and he was super stoked, super serious and ready to play, he didn't even really want to hear the tune. You know, he just was like, let's go for it, man. What, you know, and he wanted to be as reactive and in the moment as possible. Great. And that, that's why he didn't want to rehearse. And that's why he probably didn't even hear the, the tape that I sent him. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, it was, it was the most refreshing experience, you know, just having him. And when, when he sat down, man, he was, you know, he was there, man. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, he was so present and so ready to listen and to, to and we just, uh, uh, it was a great lesson to me and it made me feel relaxed, you know, from the first note, I was like, Oh, I get it. And it was, it was infectious. You know, that, that sort of attitude was like, well, if he's not worried, then, then I'm not supposed to worry, you know? So it, let's, he's totally listening to me. So I don't have anything to worry about. And, and it's not what I imagined. It's not, you know, it's it's what it's got it's what it's gonna be it's what it's what it is you know you can't you can't um pre-think what something should be when you have someone like paul motion you know he's uh, or anybody for that matter you know uh, you have to leave i always like leave, leaving a certain amount of spontaneity to the to the moment but this was like it's all gonna happen here yeah you know? and that was uh really amazing and there were a few things where we did two takes of something where I listened back to hear the piano sound and whatever. And I thought I'm playing very, I'm playing too traditionally. I sound um, like I was almost as if I was not trusting enough on, you know, and then we did another take. It was the tune. Uh, you do something to me, mm -hmm. the that's quarter but, tune. But that's without Paul. You're right. <laughs> You're right. Okay, that's without Paul. But the point the point is <laughs> that's without Paul. Uh, you, that's true. There is a there's an, a first take of that that was much more like two guys playing a standard, you know. And then I just sort of made this conscious like switch because you know with La with Larry it was the same. With Grenadier it was the same. He's he's such a such a supportive player that and he was probably more experience than I was at being in sort of freer situations and at any rate Paul was nothing but supportive and great and just wanted to be totally spontaneous and it was awesome and my my regret is that we didn't make a full record with him and I literally played three tunes with him live with that band where and that's we never toured where? at Carnegie Hall did you record I didn't record it. No. 
Man, I'd love to hear this. Wow. I think it was part of a Warner Brothers night or something like that. And so I was representing that record, you know, for three tunes. And then there was another Warner, maybe Brad was there. And that's the only gigs we ever did. Such a shame. But, um, but I remember that about the record. Um, I remember, um, I remember his smile. I remember him just, enjoy, just enjoying it, you know. But I thought, but he was generous in every way, you know, especially with the music, you know, and um, and I think I think I was very confused at that time as to what, why should I now suddenly go out with a with, a, with if I could, I never even looked into it really, but I was confusing to me the idea of suddenly leaving the organ trio thing temporarily and like going out with Palma that it felt weird to me. Yeah. I think, I think I hadn't fully embraced, um, my personality as a pianist, mm. you know, it almost felt more like an, ex like an experiment, you know, at that time, did you get more gigs playing the organ, you know, all oh, yeah. side, side man gigs? I mean, all people wanted from me was organ. Mm. Yeah. So I knew it was also going to be a struggle to sell people on, or maybe with Paul Motion, it would be a lot easier. I probably, you know, I didn't know what I was doing in terms of promoting myself or knowing what I wanted, you know, and, uh, or, and I certainly didn't feel confident, very confident about going out as a piano player, weirdly enough. Um, mostly because it felt like I had already made the switch, you know, and in people's minds, it, it seemed like, and also promoters' minds, They, I think they already thought of, thought of me as an organ player, uh, not only because of the records that I had made, but the, some of the Sidemen records that had gotten heard a lot more than my own records, like Schofield. Yeah. Um, so I've definitely have a, I, I've had a lot of confidence problems about my piano playing. And only recently d d have I gotten over that. How? Huh? How? Because, uh, related to what I said earlier, I just don't care that there are certain things that other people can do that I can't. <laughs> I think it's more important to focus on the fact that I think that there are things that I can do that other people can't. Not that that's the point of <laughs> getting out there and playing, but the point is to feel like you're giving something that's you, you know? And I feel like I can do that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's okay that whatever those things are might not be the expectations of everybody who comes to hear you. Mm. Uh, but I do feel like I have the power to communicate. Yeah. And, and I feel like that's enough. <laughs> and uh, whether it's, whether you label it as jazz or this or that, um, I feel like people don't give a, a damn about that. Audiences don't. I mean, if, if, you know, if you are communicating something to them and you see smiles on their faces, you know, uh, and you're also satisfying your own intellectual and spiritual needs or whatever, then that's what it's, that's, that's what it's about. So, um, And I have really adjusted my, my playing uh, in such a way that I'm going to avoid things that I don't feel are going to sound like my greatest strengths. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, I'm okay with that. Yeah. You know, because I don't want to be frustrated. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't want to have to play a fast tempo because yeah. you, because Somebody said, you have to have yeah, it. yeah, fuck that. I think that's limited thinking. And also, why would I put myself in a position where I'm feeling like I'm struggling? I'm not saying that I don't want to challenge myself. Yeah. I still want to, I mean, the, my way of challenging myself is by, try, you know, being spontaneous within that framework, being really spontaneous, you know, and, um, thinking of a tune that you've never played and just play it.
because you love it and you know you know you know it like yeah like you know it as well as happy birthday so you know and and uh or playing something that that's not a tune with people that you know are completely the right people to do that but you know we have to say you play some fast tunes on your shows i've heard you play fast well well on organ yeah And I can play faster on organ. I can I can be more consistent. Let me put it that way on organ. And um, that's just the nature of the fact that you don't have to worry about sound production when you hit a note. And um, But, and no. and by the fact that I've been playing mostly organ gigs, you know. But um, don't you? I mean, I'm not an organ player, but I've sat on an organ. Yeah. And. The fact that you get the sound immediately, doesn't that, my way of thinking was that that actually we, requires a lot more focus and also control it over, does. over your articulation. It so does. That, why is that then easier to play? You know, why is it easier then? I, I don't really, I don't really get it. Well, I, I agree. Yeah, you're right. Articulation, you're still dealing with choices, a lot of choices there that you can make. Volume pedal is the way that you compensate for having an instrument that just plays at one volume. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, articulation is one thing, but as long as you hit the note, you're going to get the sound at that level that that volume pedal is at you don't you know what i mean like whereas if you've got a hard ass german steinway you know you either can play it or you can't you know i mean you i mean you're, uh so yes it does it does it does require a different set of skills having to do with control and stuff like that But the one thing that is removed from that equation is, you know, the actual, can you make a sound, you know, anybody can, can make a sound on an organ. You just have to put your finger on the, on the thing and it'll, it'll be as loud as you set it to be, you know. So then it's just about taking that and then controlling, controlling it. And, um... I've really grown to love, you know, that the organ for that, for, for those challenges, you know, I feel really comfortable dealing with those challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I love using the volume pedal, you know, and it makes me feel like, you know, orchestral and it, it, you can breathe with the thing and, um, and uh, electric instrument at times, you know, it doesn't really, you know, like yeah of an electric instrument it doesn't feel like that you know obviously when a good player plays it but that yeah. that, that breathe element that really yeah i feel like i can get really close you know it's closer to like the human yeah. voice you know um and when you play quarterly you can get closer to a human a hum you know several human voices or or orchestral instruments and um the equivalent to like turning the Leslie on on a chord would be doing that on the piano, you know? And so like, it's all about like, how do you, I, I know the the feeling I want to get a, out of the music right now. So how, how, how can it be done? You know, how do I translate it to from one instrument to another? But I feel like I'm more consistently sort of solid technically on, on the, on the organ. Hmm. I struggle more with in general with pianos um that's one of the reasons why i think i've you know in some ways have more feel more confident as an organ player i felt like i found my voice on an organ earlier than i yeah did or maybe i i'm still searching for it on piano i don't know but it, but be, but that's mostly because i was gigging way more as an organ player so i really you know had a lot of experience yeah um with my own playing my own music in in in, a, in my own in, environment you know with my own with my guys so i remember buying the sweet science record oh uh when i was a teenager in a store i always went to but that record really made a 
made a huge impact. The initial, you know, falling in love with, with your music and your organ playing record. Mm. I think I also transcribed a couple of solos, at least one from those tunes, you know, maybe this guy's in love with you, I think I did. Mm. You know, the stuff I've talked before, um, that the the melodic, you know, uh, not sounding predictable, but really hitting that spot where you say, yeah, I, you know, I have to, uh, I, can't, I can't do anything but accept what, you know, I, I said it before. But yeah. the tunes on there where you're all listed as composers, but yeah. I'm feeling that it was kind of a jam. Right. And I was, I, I'm curious about those. Uh, I mean, I'm curious about the whole record, but, you know, um, I'm not sure if you did things like that on, on records before that, but it really sounded... Uh, no. I'm, I'm wondering about this. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for it now on, uh, on Apple Music just to refresh my memory. <laughs> Um, and I can read it to you. I have it here. Sweet science. So it's the tune "Sweet Science" and um, yeah, uh, "Come in and Pray." Also, I think. Right. Right. <laughs> Where that starts was like probably six minutes in. Ah, okay. To a to a jam to to a, a jam. Yeah. And I did all the editing <laughs> for the for the record. So sweet science, look out. That's that's Bill's tune. Gnomesville. <laughs> Gnomesville. And come in and pray. We're all just free playing. So, um, because, uh, nobody prepared any fucking music. <laughs> I had, I had Asimov, Solid Jack was just a spontaneous blues. Yeah. That we made that, that we made up. Um, not even a blues. Actually, it's only like an eight bar blues. Mm. Or, or at least the blowing is. Um, I had this guy's in love with you and Pegasus, which I recorded on our first record. Yeah, which which I I wrote when I was at the New School, and I brought it into a class that Donald Bird was teaching. And Donald said, "Okay, let me let me check." And he was the first first time I ever heard that tune played was Donald Bird. Oh, in class, and you know, do you know do you know the tune at all? Sure, yeah. When it when it when it goes to the bridge and it goes up the fourth, and then. When it goes back to the A, it goes boop 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 B. That wasn't written. Donald Donald did that. He went boop 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 B B B B. It was like, yeah, yeah. taking taking that. So anyway, that was just a re-record of that, just because we had been playing it live, and I didn't like that first record. I didn't like me on that first record. Um, so. So there's a there, there's a loop coming up. There's something that um That's a loop right there. I never got this. Wow. I think and then
from there on, it's the performance, I think. But like when I doubled the melody there, I did that as an overdub. I was wondering about that because it sounds so, you know, it sounds so spontaneous, everything. And then all of a sudden you guys like play something in unison. And I was like, where is this coming from? Yeah, it was an overdub. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I tried to shape shape it into something that sounded more like a composition. Yeah. Uh, and also, that was based on an earlier recording. There's like, you know, on Long Story Short, there's some th things. Yeah, I love that. That came from another session mm -hmm. that exists. And the first version of that, Sweet Science, or no, Lookout. Lookout, we were trying to recreate something that we had done on this thing at my friend. It was in L.A. that we did it. I mean, the original recordings mm. uh, that were jams at my friend's studio. So um, I notated like the main, some, some nice melodies that came out of that jam and then made that into a tune for, for Lookout, I think. I could send you the, the original thing. It's pretty cool, actually, because Bill's on a, on a drum set that he would never play. It's like a bigger, bigger bass drum. I'd like to share. Send me every like y'all okay. any outtakes you know from the oh my god no you don't want to, you don't want to hear outtakes dude believe me. i want to hear everything Ugh. everything that you'd like to share please share it okay and then gnomesville has a whole bunch of i finished gnomesville at my house with with a with a korg or with a with a fake organ hmm. so there's some stuff like this melody yeah is on a on a fake organ And this thing. Now the rhythm section's looped. Pretty sure. No. No, I just we just were jamming with that blah 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 blah, and I thought, okay, I'll put something here later, you know. Yeah. I think that's how that happened, and then I said, I'll just, and then on the bridge will just be whatever the fuck that was. Right, so when it comes back, that's me at home on a on a fake organ playing to the original track we did at that studio in um, Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, and it was just another thing like let's just jam and I'll finish it. Well, I'll edit it. I'll finish it through editing, you know. And then come in and pray was another one that went on forever. And. Um, I made a lot of edits to it. It was probably twice as long, at least. And me and the um, engineer, I just, I just, we'd listen to it and I'd go, I don't like what's happening here, so I don't want to use this. I don't want to use this. And we just condensed it into something that, that I felt um, then took, out, took on a good shape. I love Miles, I Miles did it. <laughs> yeah, sure. And my weather report did it, you know. I love how these songs, how these songs balance out the record in a way, you know. You know I do, I do uh, I obsess also about sequencing. I'm sure you do yeah. too. Um, and so once you come home with everything, you still don't know if it's all gonna mm. work together. Um, and I'm sure there were tunes in here that didn't make it. Or maybe there weren't because we had so little coming into the session. <laughs> mm -hmm. We were sitting there the second day, like, "Okay, guys, what are we going to record?" And um, you rem remember that Facebook uh, chat we had about Asimov and uh, S One? Yeah, where I was like mistakenly asking you, 
did you ever play Asimov with Michael Brecker? Because I, I had a dream about it, or I think I heard it, you know, in my dream. Mm. And then we discovered that I actually had a bootleg of you guys playing as one and then going into Asimov for the blowing. So I had, had actually heard it, and then I sent it to you. Amazing. Now I'm wondering, did you maybe record as one and Asimov together with your trio at some point? Probably. Yeah. yeah. Coming out of the I never record, recorded it like that, but I think we played it like that. Ah, okay. Yeah. It works yeah. perfectly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wish we would play um, This Guy's In Love With You. I, I think I want to bring that back to the trio. I love playing that tune. Solid Jack, as I said, was just, um, Peter, just play these notes, you know. Yeah. You know, that's the melody, and I'll just harmonize under it. And, um, yeah, spring is here. Spring is here. Yeah. For but uh, yeah, you're right. we've never we've never uh, approached um, a record like that really. It's true. Beautiful, love it. Thank you. Yeah, we should do it. We should do it for our next one. Can you tell me a little bit of about "Time Is of the Essence"? How did it feel to play with those three drummers? The Brecker uh, record. Um, that was great. Can I say? I was I was very nervous. I was having a I just had a baby, our first child, right around then. So that was an intense time, and I was like, yeah, I was very nervous about it, about the session. I mean, the Elvin day is the one that I can remember the best because I walked in there and there was Elvin. Somebody introduced me, and he picked me up, and and gave me a bear hug. That was his thing. Yeah, he'd give you a bear hug, lift you off the ground. You know, that's how he'd greet you. <laughs> so. Um, after I got back from the emergency room, <laughs> um, he was just, just so, so warm and amazing. And, um, but I couldn't really control my nerves. I, I just, I just hadn't convinced myself that I wasn't going to get fucked up, uh, in terms of knowing what he was doing, like on a trip, you know, on a, like trading or something like that. Um, but basically after sort of changing my mix, because I was hearing a lot of his his snare mic at first, and I was just so fucking confused. Yeah. And then I had James Farber, the engineer, come over and listen to what I was listening to. I guess oh, I'll fix it. And and then I just said, fucking relax. Don't worry about it. You know this music. You can do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there was a few funny moments where, like, nobody came in after Elvin did an eight-bar intro, you know. That made me feel a little bit better. Yeah. But when you're the bass player and the organ player and nobody comes in, that's, you know, you're two people that aren't coming in. So it's, you know, but, um, but man, once, once we got started, it was, uh, I mean that there's a D minor blues on there. I think it's mm -hmm. Pat's. I remember that feeling like I can do no wrong. Like, like I just felt so free. I just felt like I was floating. Yeah. And uh, I really liked the organ. I could hear that, you know, everything was, I could, I could feel that he was totally tuned into me too. It wasn't like I might've had this stupid thought that, oh, Elvin's just does his own thing, you know? And no, he's just part of the reason why he's so great is because he, he listens so hard and he was just so there. So it was just like, I, I really only other uh, one other early time like that where I on, on piano where I felt like I didn't have to ever think about where the comping was was gonna go to feel good was playing with Grady Tate mm. in a completely different circumstance, but I felt like like I could make no wrong decision rhythmically. You know, it's just he's he's just making me know how to play like it's like crazy. And that was the same with Elvin. It was just so, it was so fun. <laughs> Once I stopped worrying, it was so fun. Yeah. To feel, to, to, to know what it felt, to have an idea of what it felt like as a bass player, um, to play to play with that, and to find your your space in that time. It was just, it was beautiful. So it was a great experience. Did you give notes or instructions or like tips or anything? Did he? Did he? Yeah. Did he come? No. no he just played. Yeah. No. Um, 
his wife was there probably to make you know to make sure he wasn't having over his quota of beer if anybody was giving instructions it would have been pat and or mike yeah but probably not to elvin <laughs> <laughs> uh elvin knew what to do elvin was very respectful to, to the music he knew the music or he learned it quick and uh and of course, and the days with, uh, with with Bill were equally great, sure. and much, much more familiar sure. to me. And in a certain way, I could relax more. And then uh, I guess the ones with Tane were the was was a newer kind of feel, cause a little bit more on top than what I was used to on yeah. some of the. But all all three were great choices. To- totally different personalities. And Tane just has a different energy, but he swings swings his ass off. I love how uh, you tune. I mean, how you guys play together on your tune. Sound off. Is that Tane? I think so. Oh, you're right. I hated playing that live because it was so fucking fast, and the and the blowing changes that I wrote I never liked. <laughs> yeah. I still I still don't. I, it's easy to lose your form on those blowing changes, mm. and uh, I. I've never played that tune since Michael. Mm. I've never played that tune. Um, I, I was grateful that you know, when I submitted it, you know, they wanted to do it. And I love how Pat interpreted it. He was great. Every, um, it fitted the, the situation perfectly. Yes. Yeah. Sure. But um, the main challenge was, was learning that music. There was a lot of complex... Yeah. You know, on some of those tunes, Mike had very specific things that needed to be played because they were integrated into the, as, you know, into the melody. Renaissance Man, for instance. Yeah. Uh, I ne- I thought I'd never get that together, but um, but we did. And um, how how do you go about when somebody like uh, Michael Brecker sends you a lot of music? How do you how do you prepare? I probably blow it off until I know that I'm too I'm it's too close to the date that I to not learn it and so then I just decide I need to learn this. Mm-hmm. I have to walk in there knowing this. So <laughs> I don't do that consciously but I do it because uh, I I'm I'm scared of of starting the process. Yeah. Um but once I know that okay got four days i've got nothing to do so i can do this you know then i just um but i remember just having to drill some of that shit because my reading isn't that great and i just i was just filling in like letter notes you know (laughs) under the chords you know because and i just yeah uh drilling it with the with the demo that he sent me just making sure it sounded exactly like (laughs) what he sent me and um how worked out are his demos? Because he, he could play a lot of instruments, right? Yeah. Like on a tune like that, you know, it was it was exactly what was written. And it was on a, some synth sound or something like that. and A drum machine or something. And him playing. Yeah. And, and, then that, and then it would just peter out. There wouldn't be any solo. You know, it would just be the tune. That's, God, I must have them somewhere. It would be interesting to, to <laughs> listen to. Um, so that's how I approached that, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, not all of it was, but yeah, some of it was like, uh, you know, like Wayne writes out all his piano music, right? Yeah. I would need to study that shit. It's yeah. Crazy. Me too. And that would be just the notes. I wouldn't know what to do after that. Um, but, um, but that was excellent. And touring was, was, um, that was a lot of touring, right? I mean, that that material you played with, with Bill. We did, Pat- yeah. We did a, a big summer tour with with like festivals where where Bill did all the all the drumming, and then we did tours with Adam Rogers and Bill, or Adam Rogers and Clarence Penn. Yeah. But the, I also have a and Idris Idris Muhammad. I was going to say I have a bootleg of that. Yeah. It's also a beautiful combination. The tunes were great. I mean, I mean, the 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 set was so um, interesting. I think uh, it didn't always 
what didn't always uh, what wasn't always well served by some of these horribly sounding you know stadiums that we played during the summer you know but um, in fact I wish we could have done more intimate gigs you know with that with that band after that summer we did surely we did like stuff in clubs you know with with Adam and um, but um, it was great. Mike was one of the most humble people I, I ever have known for someone for someone that great. And also I mean, really generous. Boosted my ego so many times. I mean, he was just so... Because I was listening to him before I knew anything about his jazz playing. I, I knew him as the saxophone solo on this and that, you know, great pop record, you know. Whether it was Paul Simon or Steely Dan or, you know, whatever. Um so he was like a hero. Yeah. But such a great guy and um very self effacing, very um hard on himself, extremely. <laughs> and a very strong person because I was also out with him when he was taking a very strong drug for his hepatitis C, which basically made him feel like he had the flu for a year every day of his life like a bad flu feeling, you know, and he went on the road <laughs> wow. and he played his ass off and he didn't complain except when he had to complain, but he didn't complain a lot and he fucking slugged through it. He didn't want to be the guy complaining all the time about his health and this and that. Yeah. And I couldn't believe what he put himself through, both the rigor of traveling and playing on that level. It was unbelievable. Wow. Um, so that was great. I miss him too. Yeah, sure. Such a, a gentle person. He was great. How was he in terms of giving directions as a band leader? Pretty, pretty specific. He could be specific if he needed it to be. Yeah. If he needed, um, he definitely knew what he was hearing. He knew what he wanted. But I don't remember a lot of direction. He did obsess also about the, I think, about the structure of the set and stuff like that. And but he he could be so so self uh, self deprecating. It was it was it was amazing. We were sitting on sitting together on a flight, and I said I was we were just talking about music. And I said um, I said I. I want, I said, you know, on this tour, I'm thinking about, I want to work out like a whole bunch of like really cool sounding technical stuff. That's just stuff that I don't really have under my belt that I, I can just sort of pull out, you know, when I need, when I need it to sound flashy and cool and modern. And he starts laughing and I, and he, I goes, what's so funny? He's like, you've just described exactly the way I play. <laughs> <laughs> like that's all I do. I just pull out stuff that I've worked out, and I, you know, like, you know, no, no. Yeah, it's not what. No, it. no, you don't, Michael. Um, but that's you know, he was like, he, 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 he really thought that I was describing him. You know, I was like, uh, and and it may be the case that he had a lot of devices and things like that, but well, he invented them. He invented them, and so they all, you know, and he know he knew when and how to use them, you know, and and. I think they just kind of came to his mind, you know. And he was also quite spontaneous. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like he just played licks. No. He was very melodic, oh, so that's why he wrote great tunes. Yeah. He was really melodic, but he was a great, great cat. Yeah. Yeah. Those were good times. And also, if you would do it, if you would do a record, you knew you had to go to the record store and go buy it as soon as you can because it was kind of a, you know, an event. In a, in a, yeah, an event like the new record is out. Have you have you heard it yet? You know. Well, actually, any any record coming out is not is <laughs> no record anymore is an event because mm -hmm. it's just so immediately available everywhere all the time. True. Yeah. And uh, well, I remember when I told my mom that she had to take me to the record store because um, Gaucho was coming out, mm -hmm. you know, I, we woke up, I woke up 
half an hour before that store opened and said, let's, let's go mom. Yeah. You know? And I remember seeing that thing and it was in my hands. Yeah. I wish we could have that feeling about music now, you know? <laughs> Also, I've done a few uh, things as Hans Groiner, um, oh. which has been also, there's a whole live gig that's just in the can with three cameras that I did at a club here that I haven't, we haven't edited. And that's been, um, you know, believe it or not, it's just a very creative outlet as well, you know, and is a, uh, is it's just a, a very refreshing way to try to figure out how to, um, actually, I think what it is, 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 um, I'm, 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 ge I'm getting a little bit more comfortable about the idea of marrying my, all my facets of my personality. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I can't, it's hard for me to not, um, what am I trying to say? It, it's it, it, I, 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 I don't want to it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to mix the two you know but um, I like the idea that I'm that uh, I can deliver something di other than the serious music mm. and it feel, still feels like part of me it still feels like something that I want to share somehow you know I feel like you 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 manage that balance also on your on your trio gigs when you announce stuff. You can sort of tip into that too. Well, that's where that's where it all comes from. Is, yeah. is take, taking those moments and deciding, oh, maybe I can do something more with, with that. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what that all is about, but it, it does feel that humor stuff that I that I might do in between songs. I think it helps connect to the audience. You know. Also, it, it shows me that you're uh, even more in the moment also because you're accepting that part of you and not saying like, I'm the serious guy. No, I have to be, I have to be the, yeah. and that way you're more yourself, uh, you know, yeah. you're not playing the music. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a holistic thing about it. Like, you know, like, uh, uh it, it is something that is hard for me to suppress you know so so my juggling is coming along and i uh you know i hope by the end of the year i can juggle cats mm -hmm.